Um, come back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Now, you know, we, we get to talking about the law and how this thing, you know, it, it condemns, it, it makes you see the sin and all this kind of good stuff. But there's something you've got to remember. Look at verse 12, Romans chapter 7, verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Okay? The law is good. But remember this. The law is good for what it's good for. Okay? Um, and, you know, we who are, are rightly dividers have to, to make sure to explain this properly, right? Um, again, it's good for what it's good for. The law is not the bad guy in the dispensation of grace, okay? It is not the bad guy. It's still here, it's still useful, but the law itself is good. It's not the bad guy. But it's also, remember this, the law is not the saving formula. That's where we as rightly dividers make a big difference, make a big departure from orthodox doctrine and theology, okay? Is we don't see the law as sort of the you know, step-by-step -step plan to get you there. That's not what it is because the Bible is pretty clear that you're not going to be justified by the works of the law. And Paul even goes as far as to say, you've got to stop people from saying that stuff. We've kind of lost that battle. I'm going to be honest with you. We've lost that battle, at least down south. You know, for all of our Bible beltness and all of our religiosity down here, uh, we're kind of the worst among us, to be honest with you. We, we got all this garbage down here that we, we as people who are rightly dividers in this context, in some ways have it harder. We're more like missionaries down here because we've got to figure out ways to break the soil of denominationalism in people's hearts before we can plant the seeds of right division. Okay, we've got to overcome that first. And, uh, and so anyway... Um, it can be difficult, but uh, again, the law is not the bad guy, um, but it's also not the saving formula. Now, the thing is, is that Israel is actually finding this out the hard way. Y'all turn with me to Romans chapter 9. To this day, this is still true. Romans chapter 9, look with me at uh, verse 31. Romans chapter 9 and verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? And, and he's saying, why? Why haven't they? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. They rejected Christ, okay? They did not trust him. They did not have faith in him. And so, as a result, they decided instead of doing what God asked them to do, that they would instead continue to do the works of the law to be saved. And guess what? They ended up getting the complete opposite of what they were trying to get, right? Today, that is still the case with, with Orthodox Judaism, okay? They are still trying to do the works of the law to be righteous and to earn salvation on sins, and it's just not going to happen. Now, um, let me kind of share a story with you. The, the law, by, you know, again, the law, it's a good thing, all right? But it can be frustrating. I can remember growing up as a kid, um, my family, we would, you know, once a year, we would, we would drive up north to visit my grandparents, my mom's parents. And, you know, back in the 80s, the speed limit on the interstate was 55. And Lord have mercy. That is a long trip. So we would drive from Meridian, Mississippi, you know, go through Jackson and hit I-55 and go up north through St. Louis and then up into Illinois and, and go visit my grandparents every year. And it was at least 10 hours in the car. And me and my sister in the back seat of the Buick, man, 
Let me tell you, that was a long, long stinking day. We would leave, it was dark in the morning, and we'd get there, it was dark at night. That <laughs> kind of thing, you know. Uh, and my sister, I'm going to throw her under the bus because it's her turn. And she was mean. She was an agitator. And so y'all know, like, after so much of you parents, you know, you did it, do one of them numbers, you know, trying to reach in and smack you to get you to stop fighting and bickering. We don't know what that's like. Anyway, um, and so it just agitated my sister. You know, so uh, mama would turn around because she's frustrated because daddy's getting mad, you know, and she just wants him to shut up. So she's like, will y'all stop? <laughs> Your daddy is about to pull this car over, you know. And, and then so she would do what a lot of mamas would do in their great wisdom, draw the imaginary line in the middle of the seat. Y'all see this line? You don't cross this side, and you don't cross that side, and y'all just sit back here and behave. Don't cross the line. So we're sitting back there. I'm scared to death. If I cross the line, it's death. What does my older sister do? Uh huh. She agitates. That's what she does. All she, her whole mission in life was to make my life miserable. And she was good at it. I hope one day she watches this video because it's true. All right, um, I, the word, and I think I, I don't know if I've told this story before. Now, y'all, this is before I knew Jesus. Okay, so I was bad, I was rough. Um, but we were at the house. We said so after school. Me and Carrie, we would get home before mom and daddy would get home. We'd be home for a couple hours for mom and daddy to get home. They work, you know. So I remember one day we got home from school and I went in my room. I'm playing with some Legos or whatever on the floor, minding my own business. And my agitating old sister decided, well, that's not any fun. So she came into my room and she started agitating me, started poking at me, poking at me, poking, and trying to get me all riled up and get me mad. Well, she did. I started chasing her around the house. Now, y'all know God gave me the gift of a mouth. <laughs> I talk a lot, just like Seth does. And so I, his name is Gregory Seth for that very reason, you know, because he's a talker just like me. God gave him the gift too. And so... So as I'm chasing my sister through the house, who I hate her guts at this point because she wouldn't leave me alone, just let me do my thing, I'm yelling out and I'm cussing her as loud as I possibly can. I'm yelling cuss words and I mean every cuss word in the book. I'm stringing them together. It's not even making any sense and I'm just cussing her. What I did, so I chased her. Finally, I chased her into her room and then she got there before it did. She slammed the door and locked it. Well, that didn't stop me. I'm beating on the door and I'm yelling at the top of my lungs cuss words at her because she deserved it. What I didn't know is she had a tape recorder on the other side of that door. <laughs> and she was recording me cussing her out. And of course, at that point, she's quiet as a mouse. She ain't saying a word. And wouldn't you know, as soon as my mama gets home, she says, Mama! In that nagging voice, and so I hear my mama go into Carrie's room, and next thing I know, I could kind of hear my mom crying in there. I didn't know what was going on. And next thing I heard, she said, Greg Willis, you get your tail in here right now. And I was like, what did I do? <laughs> and when I walk into the room, she said, play it, Carrie. And I'm like, what, she want me to dance or something, you know? She plays that tape recorder with me cussing. And she said, were you cussing your sister? And I did not say, Mama, I'm sorry. I said, well, duh. <laughs> I know, Rita. It's a wonder I'm still alive. It's a wonder I have lived to tell this wonderful story so y'all can all laugh at me, right? And... Uh, that was the worst spanking I ever got in my life. Ain't no doubt. Because my mom thought I was, well, I was. I was burning and going to hell. Let me tell you, I was just, the, the flames of the fires of hell were just, you know, Duh, they were <laughs> consuming me, man. I mean, I was ate up with it. And she ate my pants down after she called me because she chased me. She had to chase me because I took off running because I knew right then it was my, the death of me. And she pulled my pants down and she wore my butt out with her hand. And I mean, it hurt. My dad's with me with his belt, but my mom's bare hand on a bare butt, that don't feel good, you know. Especially when she was angry. And she was going to beat the devil out of me, okay. And she did. 
But, uh, but anyway, um, there was another time. I got plenty of stories, so I'm going to tell them all because my sister was an agitator. And I want y'all to get to this point, okay? So we were outside one day, and uh, I was out there playing basketball. And she's minding my own business, shooting basketball, you know. And my sister decided she wanted to come out there, and she wanted the basketball. And so she took the basketball from me, and she started shooting. I get it back. She takes it back. And so finally, I decided, all right, and I spit in her face. That's what you're supposed to do, y'all. This is, this, is how, this is how kids are supposed to do things, right? <laughs> if you do this, no, Seth, you need to hear the rest of the story before you jump to conclusions and go spit in your sister's face. So my sister said, Daddy! And Daddy had a shop. And what he would do is when he would get home from work, he had a little upholstery business. And he was out there, him and Mama were working on re, uh, finishing a chair. And she went and ran to the shop, and Daddy was busy, you know, and he was always stressed out. And anyway, so she goes in there, and she said, Greg, spit in my face. That's all she said. You know, she ain't going to give any of the context, you know, her coming out there and agitating me and stealing the ball and stuff. And all of a sudden, I hear my dad say, Greg Willis, get in here. And I was like, oh, man. And he said, did you spit in your sister's face? I said, yeah, because she saw the ball from me. He said, all right, stand right there. He said, Carrie, you stand right there. You face Greg. Y'all, this is gross. My sister, she hacked up the worst loogie of her life, and she spit that in my face. I'll never forget that feeling. My hatred for my sister is strong. Because she's an agitator. That's what agitators do. They agitate. I got more stories. I'm telling you, I could go all day long. I mean, it was just life. Um, the law is an agitator. The law is an agitator. Now, now hear me on this. I know I just gave a lot of examples of how a bad agitator looks. Okay? But the law is an agitator, but it's a good agitator. In, in this sense, y'all know like when you open the lid to your washing machine? Well, the old ones, not the front load junky ones that don't work. The old ones that use 800 gallons of water, you know, that actually get your clothes clean. When you open the lid, you know that big, like, mast in the middle of it? You know what it's called, Rita? An agitator. And, you know, that agitator's a good thing because what does it do? It helps your clothes get clean. Without that agitator, it doesn't do all this stuff. Like this is going to experience in a little while. You know, it doesn't agitate clothes. Agitators are good things. Even my sister, as much as she was of the devil, in some senses it was good because it brought all of my evil to the surface, didn't it? It exposed me for what I was. Right? <laughs> Shut up, Rita. <laughs> you're such a you're my, and my sister. I knew there was somebody I like about you. It's over between us, Rita. Uh, okay, Rita Craig, get up there and <laughs> let's fight it out. Um that was another story that made us fight it. Anyway, but uh anyway, an agitator. The law is an agitator. It brings out the sin. It exposes the sin. It's holy. It's good. But it feels like it ain't. Right? Because it agitates. Look with me in Romans chapter 7. Come back to uh, verse 10. And Paul says, And the commandment which was ordained to life, what? I found <laughs> to be unto death. It was agitating. It was aggravating. Remember, he said, I was alive once without the law. And all of a sudden, this agitator comes along and sin revives. And suddenly I feel like, man, this thing is just bringing about death. But keep reading. Look at verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. See, the law agitates because, like the, that constant poking of my sister, 
It says, hey, hey, here's, here's what's right and here's what's wrong. That's what the law does. It's just constant. Hey, here's what's right. Here's what's wrong. I read a good illustration earlier uh, by a guy named George Williams uh, from the early 1900s. Excellent commentary on the Bible. But uh, he explains this in this way. He says, imagine some, some soil, okay, and the sun rises. And as that sun rises in the sky, weeds start to pop up in that soil. Now, is the sun evil? It causes those weeds to pop up, right? No. What you discover is that the soil has a condition. It has an issue in and of itself. The sun itself is not the bad guy. Okay? And so, we've got to remember this. Uh, and if you're not careful, and boy, this is so easy to do, and, and this is what I love about Romans chapter 7 because we can kind of relate to Paul and what he's saying. We've all experienced this. But if you're not careful, you'll convince yourself in the, in the height of sin in your life or whatever else, or the devil will convince you that the law is the culprit. And if it weren't there, and if it wasn't so strict, you might be all right, right? Right? That's what will start to happen. This is why so many people give up on Christianity, especially when Christianity is all about the law. Because now the devil's gotten in their head and their flesh is going, this is just too much, too much. It, this, this has created a problem in my life. I was all good until I got into this Christianity thing. Now all of a sudden Christianity is my life and the law, the Bible, and all this stuff. So forget it. I want to go back to being happy because the ultimate goal of life is to be... <laughs> Y'all see the problem? What does the Bible say? The law is holy. The law is good. What it exposes and shows us though is there's something innate in us. There is something that is in the fabric of our being that is a problem. And it's devious. It's a problem. It's evil. It's sin. And so this is, by the way... Uh, What's happening in our country when it, as it relates to criminal law? I don't know if y'all have noticed this. People have this hatred for law nowadays. Have y'all noticed that? And I've even noticed how politicians, boy, they're, they're ugh, slimy. But they say, you know, um, we got so many people breaking the law, like for example with marijuana. And so... Instead of convicting them, they've said, well, let's change the law. The law's the problem. How stupid. Right? I know. I know. There could be medicinal uses for marijuana. I get it. Cotton, you ain't token it up, are you? <laughs> no, I'm going to call everyone out. Yeah. Who's Rita? <laughs> Rita got real quiet. She looked down. I'm kidding. No, she didn't. Uh, <laughs> I probably shouldn't got off on this tangent now. I'm going to get myself in trouble. But you, you get my point. It, it's really easy. The world can do this, can support this notion that this is just too much. Your flesh can chime in and really convince you it's okay to do certain things. The only reason why it's bad is because something says it's bad. Who cares what it says? Right? And you've got to be careful with that kind of thinking. What, the, what is the real culprit? Look at verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me, Paul says? In other words, was the law made death unto me? And he, what does he say? God forbid. No. No, 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 no. Misunderstanding there. But sin, that's the culprit. Sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding Sinful, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. Paul here, in that particular scenario, is even speaking as a believer. When we talk about being carnal, now Paul, there's three particular words that Paul uses that you need to be, you need to have a good understanding of. He talks about the natural man. So the natural man is the lost man, because born in your natural state, you're born in Adam, which means you are lost. Okay? Then there's the spiritual man. So you got the natural man, but then you have the spiritual man. Now what is the spiritual man? The man that has the Spirit of God. What is he? 
He's saved. So you got lost and saved. And then in the middle, you've got this word carnal. Okay? That means someone who has the Spirit, but instead of walking after the Spirit, following His lead, they are listening to the flesh. So look, it's even true as a believer that what can happen is your flesh and the sin in your flesh, okay, can really play some tricks on you. Can really, really mess you up. And so we've got to be careful because sin, boy, it'll use every means it can to try to dupe you because that's what it is. It is just that purely just off. And so when we talk with the lost, it's easy for them to point the finger at God and say, you know, he's mean simply because they, they don't like rules or authority or whatever the case may be. But it's important for us to help them see that the rules are not the bad guy. The law is not the bad guy. It's not the culprit. It's the sinful flesh that's the problem that's making us look at the law and go, this ain't right. Okay? We have to be able to point that out. And so, um, but, you know, again, let's be honest. And we can be honest about this. It's not a problem. It doesn't affect our doctrine. The rules are not fun. They're not easy. They're, they're not convenient. They, they feel oppressive. They feel nagging. They're persistent. They're unforgiving. They're relentless. And so we find ourselves in a battle constantly against the good guy. Isn't that weird? Even as saved people, we find ourselves in a battle against the good guy. Paul says this in, in Galatians, is the spirit lusteth after the flesh and the flesh after the spirit. There's that constant battle. It's important for us when we, especially when somebody first comes to a knowledge of Christ and, and they begin their journey as a believer, that we help them understand right off the bat. I mean right off the bat. You are now engaged in a daily struggle that you're going to experience in real ways. There are going to be things that you know are right and good and you feel that urge inside of you to want to do that. But guess what? You're going to lose that battle. You're going to lose that battle. Sometimes you'll have success, but then there's going to be times you're going to lose the battle. Don't beat yourself up. What you've got to understand is what's going on there, what really is happening, and what's really happening is the culprit within you, sin, okay, is dominating your flesh. Okay? The good news, though, through Christ, is that ultimately the law will not condemn you in that sin because you've been made dead to that because of Christ. Okay, it has no impact on your eternity anymore. Praise the Lord, right? And so this is exactly kind of what, what Paul begins to voice here when you start in verse 15. Look, read with me. And again, we all, you know, everybody's read this before and understands, and you can feel this, you can see this. For that which I do, I allow not. In other words, there's stuff that he, that he does in the flesh that he, he doesn't, when he says he doesn't allow, it's not something he um, wishes to do. It's not something that he wills to do, okay? He says, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. We've all been there. Everybody has been there, Okay? If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh. And as believers, we all know this. We've got this understanding that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. You're not going to find it within yourself. Let me pause here and just say this. There's this modern philosophy that says, follow your heart. So I'm going to put it this way, follow your gut. But what does the Bible say? In your flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will... Is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. If anything comes good out of following your heart or following your gut, it is pure luck. 
<laughs> it is pure luck. It is not at all because there was something good in you. In fact, it's stupid. <laughs> all right? And so don't do that. Verse 19, For the good that I would do not, uh, for, the, for, that, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. In other words, if I do the thing that I don't want to do, okay, he says then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law. This is kind of like the law of gravity. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. It's always there, isn't it? It is. So, who's the agitator now? Little Greg. <laughs> that's what you want to say, isn't it, Rita? <laughs> it's the sin that's the agitator. Uh, now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Verse 22, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And as a believer, don't we? We want to do the, the godly thing. It's there in us and it's implanted in us by the Spirit. But verse 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And here again is verse 24. And boy, isn't this the conclusion not only of the lost, but of the saved. O wretched man that I am. Who, not what, but who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And what is the divine answer? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the divine answer. Not through the law. Not through the church. Not through doing this or that or going here or there or giving this and that. No. It is through the faith of Christ. It is through Him. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We're in bondage, folks. Even as believers, we are in bondage to sin in our flesh. It is second nature. In fact, it's first nature. It's just there. And so we have to learn to deal with it. All right. That's all I got for y'all today. Brita, questions, comments? Snyder Marks? <laughs> Brita's like, it's just cold. Shut up, Greg. All righty. Thank you, Sister Rita. <laughs> That's, that's what I'm going to start calling you now. Just to be an agitator, Sister Rita. Is that like a margarita? <laughs> margarita. Man, it is too bad that your first name went like Margaret and your middle name Rita. Man, that would have been good. Margarita. Uh, all right. Thank you all for being here today. Let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we do love you. We are grateful for your word. And Lord, even though we come to it and we discover this thing about ourselves that we really just do not like, it ultimately brings us to this place of just crying out and saying, God, we really, we've, we've got to have you. Jesus, we, we need you. And we can say, matter of factly, we can say without any hesitation that we're sinners. And we are wretched in these old bodies of death. But in that same breath, Lord, we can exclaim that You are the Savior who has rescued us. And in that, Lord, we say thank You. We do love You greatly. It's in Your name we pray. Amen.